Imagine waking up, gasping for air, your lungs burning as they fill with dust. Your nose bleeds as you cough up mud. Outside, the sky has turned black at noon. You can't see your hand in front of your face. The air itself is choking you to death. This wasn't some apocalyptic movie. This was breakfast in America's heartland during the 1930s. Children suffocated in their beds. Livestock dropped dead in the fields. Millions fled their homes as the very earth beneath their feet took to the skies. The solution? Plant a forest over 1,000 miles long. Today, we're deep diving into America's most ambitious ecological project ever attempted, the Great Plains Shelter Belt, a massive wall of trees stretching from Canada to Texas that most people have never even heard of. The year is 1929. Wall Street has crashed, plunging the world into the Great Depression. But for Americans living in the heartland, an even more terrifying disaster was brewing. Look at these images. Apocalyptic dust storms so massive they blotted out the sun. Locals called them black blizzards. Walls of dirt reaching 10,000 feet high and traveling at 60 miles per hour. One storm in 1934 was so powerful it carried 12 million tons of dust all the way to the East Coast. The Statue of Liberty disappeared behind a cloud of prairie soil. Ships 300 miles out at sea reported dust settling on their decks. On April 14, 1935, known as Black Sunday, a dust storm so massive it turned day to night swept across multiple states. But what caused this environmental catastrophe? Humans did. After World War I, Farmers across America embraced mechanized farming. New tractors and plows let them tear up millions of acres of native grassland that had previously been untouched. Between 1925 and 1930 alone, over 5 million new acres were plowed under. For centuries, this prairie had evolved to withstand drought. Its complex root systems held the soil in place, but once farmers stripped away this natural protection and exposed the topsoil, they effectively created a ticking time bomb. When severe drought hit in 1931, that bomb exploded. By 1934, an estimated 35 million acres of farmland were completely destroyed, with another 125 million acres rapidly losing topsoil. That's an area roughly three quarters the size of Texas turned to wasteland. The human toll was staggering. Thousands died from dust pneumonia. Approximately 2.5 million people fled the region in what became America's largest environmental migration. This included migrants from across the Plains states, not just the Dust Bowl core. Entire communities simply disappeared. The United States was facing an existential threat. Could anything stop it? When Franklin D. Roosevelt took office in 1933, he inherited not just an economic crisis, but an environmental one. His response was the New Deal, a sweeping set of programs designed to rebuild America. But as the dust storms worsened, more drastic measures were needed. That's when a revolutionary idea emerged. What if America built a giant wall to stop the winds? Not of concrete or steel, but of trees. The plan was called the Prairie States Forestry Project, later known as the Great Plains Shelter Belt. It would become one of the most ambitious environmental engineering projects in history. The concept was simple, but audacious. Plant an enormous forest spanning the entire Great Plains from North Dakota to Texas creating a living wall of trees designed to break the wind and hold the soil in place. But could it actually work? Shelter belts weren't a new concept. Farmers had used rows of trees as windbreaks for thousands of years. A moderate shelter belt just 25 feet tall can reduce wind speeds for up to 500 feet behind it, cutting erosion dramatically. What was unprecedented was the scale. No one had ever attempted a coordinated tree planting project spanning multiple states. Many experts were skeptical. The Great Plains were dry, with harsh winters and scorching summers. 
critics argued the trees wouldn't survive. Roosevelt ignored them. In July 1934, he officially authorized the project, with planning beginning earlier that summer. The project was initially envisioned with a potential cost of up to $100 million, equivalent to about $2.2 billion today. The operation began on March 18, 1935, when the first tree, an Austrian pine, was planted near Mangum, Oklahoma. What followed was a mobilization effort unlike anything before it. The government sent the Civilian Conservation Corps CCC, a New Deal program employing young men in conservation projects, the Works Progress Administration WPA, and the U.S. Forest Service to coordinate the effort. Thousands of unemployed Americans suddenly had jobs during the country's worst economic crisis. Workers received 30 cents an hour, equivalent to about $6 today. For many families, this income was the difference between survival and starvation. The logistics were staggering. Tree nurseries had to be established throughout the region to grow millions of seedlings. Careful research determined which species would survive in each area's specific conditions. The design was meticulous. Most shelter belts were 100 to 165 feet wide, with rows planted 10 feet apart. They used a tiered structure. Tall trees formed the center, flanked by shorter trees and then shrubs, creating a living wall against the wind. The Federal Soil Conservation Service, founded in 1935, worked alongside the shelter belt to promote better land management. Congress extended the program through the Norris Doxy Farm Forestry Act in 1937. By 1942, when the project wound down, as resources shifted toward World War II, workers had planted an astonishing 220 million trees across 18,600 miles of shelter belts. The tree belts weren't a single unbroken forest, but a mosaic of strategically placed shelter belts on participating farms. The wall was approximately 100 miles wide and stretched for 1,150 miles. The final price tag, just $14 million, less than 15% of the initial projection. But the true test would be whether these trees could survive the harsh Great Plains environment and whether they'd actually stop the dust storms. As the trees grew, something remarkable happened. The dust storms began to subside. The shelter belts reduced wind velocity by up to 80% in protected areas. Soil erosion dropped dramatically as the trees blocked wind and their roots held soil in place. Farmland that had been rendered useless began producing crops again. By 1939, improved weather and conservation efforts helped end the worst dust storms. Studies showed that protected fields increased crop yields by 12 to 15 percent. The trees also created habitat for wildlife and birds, which helped control pest populations naturally. What's fascinating is how quickly these benefits appeared. The young trees, even before reaching maturity, began changing the microclimate around them. They increased humidity by trapping moisture that would otherwise evaporate. This created a virtuous cycle. More moisture led to healthier soil, which supported more vegetation, which trapped more moisture. These living walls did something no concrete structure could. They improved the environment while protecting it. As one farmer from North Dakota put it in 1939, these trees saved my family's farm. Last year's winds would have taken what little topsoil I had left. Perhaps most impressively, shelter belts reduced energy costs for nearby homes by 20 to 40 percent by blocking winter winds, a crucial benefit during the economic hardship of the Depression. Families that could barely afford coal for heating found their supplies lasting longer simply because winds couldn't strip away the warmth from their homes. But the project faced challenges too. Without ongoing government support, maintenance fell to individual farmers, many of whom had full schedules with their regular work. Tree survival dropped to approximately 70%, short of the 80% target, even before the program ended in 1942. Invasive plants constantly threatened the shelter belts. Everything from small weeds to competing trees encroached on the space, and without constant attention, they could overwhelm and kill the shelter belt trees. Water competition became a serious issue as well. 
In some areas, the shelter belts competed with crops for limited groundwater, creating a difficult choice for farmers, protect their fields from wind, or ensure they had enough water. Some trees even shaded cropland, preventing proper sunlight from reaching food crops. By 1954, a government survey found alarming deterioration. About 30% of shelter belts had serious damage from livestock, while 45% were choked with dense sod and weed growth. And as farming technology advanced through the 1960s, the massive mechanical equipment required wider turning areas. Many farmers saw the trees as obstacles to progress. By the 1970s, many farmers had begun uprooting sections to make room for more farmable land. Others simply stopped maintaining them. What had once been continuous protective barriers became sporadic groups of trees that were often seen as eyesores rather than assets. So what remains today? A 2010 mapping project through the National Agroforestry Center in Nebraska found that about 79% of the original sites in that state still existed, though many were in partial condition or disrepair. A more comprehensive study in 2016 revealed the complex legacy across Nebraska. In 11 counties throughout the Northeast, Panhandle, and Central regions, between 101 and 521 original shelter belts remained intact. But 16 other countries maintained only 5 to 20 shelter belts, while many counties had none left at all. This patchwork survival tells a story of changing priorities and circumstances. Where farmers saw value, the trees remain. Where economic pressures won out, the shelter belts disappeared. Yet the project's legacy extends far beyond what physically survives. Every year, the Natural Resource Conservation Service, along with state forestry agencies and local conservation districts, plants over 20 million trees in the Great Plains and distributes another four to six million seedlings to farmers. Many of today's farmers, having witnessed climate extremes firsthand, are voluntarily rebuilding what their predecessors dismantled. The Shelter Belt was a pioneering example of agroforestry, integrating trees into farms to improve resilience. More importantly, the Shelter Belt project demonstrated that humans could not only destroy ecosystems, but restore them on a massive scale. The Great Plains Shelter Belt has inspired similar projects worldwide. In China, the Great Green Wall, or Three North Shelter Belt project, began in 1978 to combat desertification. China's full Three North project will continue through 2050, though the 3,000-kilometer Taklamakan Belt was completed in 2024. Even more ambitious is Africa's Great Green Wall Initiative. Launched in 2007, this project aims to create a 9-mile-wide, 4,800-mile-long stretch of trees across the entire width of Africa to stop the southward expansion of the Sahara Desert. The African Green Wall aims to restore 100 million hectares by 2030, with 30% completed as of 2024. So far, about 30% of the African project has been completed, with 30 million hectares of degraded land restored. With $2 billion in funding and support from the World Bank, the project continues despite challenges. Australia has recently begun its own massive reforestation effort, with plans to plant 2 billion trees by 2030, many in shelter belts, to combat climate change and habitat loss. The Great Plains Shelter Belt represents both a warning and a promise. The warning is clear. Human activities can trigger environmental catastrophes that threaten our very existence. The Dust Bowl wasn't just a natural disaster. It was man-made triggered by unsustainable farming practices that ignored the ecological balance of the plains. But the promise is equally powerful. With vision and collective action, we can repair the damage we've done. The 220 million trees planted in the 1930s didn't just stop dust storms. They showed that environmental engineering on a continental scale was possible. Today, as we face climate change and environmental degradation worldwide, the lesson of the Great Plains Shelter Belt is more relevant than ever. Sometimes, the best technology isn't high-tech at all. Sometimes, it's as simple as planting a tree, or, in this case, 220 million of them. In the end, it wasn't concrete or machines that saved the plains. It was trees. 
quiet, rooted, enduring.